I We had a very nice uh, morning with an um, interesting presentation from many different topics. And now we have the chance to discuss all these topics and specifically to discuss. Yeah, how we go with this artificial intelligence, deep learning, large language model, technology, vocabulary, knowledge graphs, all these new technologies that are coming that can facilitate processing, uh, management, discovery, and analytics of data. Uh, so, to be honest, I didn't expect that everybody is going to start this kind of starting or started very recently. So I expected that we'll have a little bit more uh, hands-on, let's say, from different tools. Only Jack has a bit more experience with those tools which are yeah, available and uh, might be useful for the problem that he is going to solve. And actually, yeah, Rope is the in this case, the most experience with the tools and what we can use to achieve different goals. And from what I saw in the morning, so there are different problems in different domains and different areas, but actually everything comes to the vocabulary, uh, to establishing what are the entities that are going to be used for a specific application. And after that, the vocabulary, the relationships, how they can be discovered from what kind of data. And we have different types of data. We can have unstructured data, like form clouds and even images. Uh, we can have all kinds of measurements. We can have structured data, like the standards, IFC or GIS standards. We can have also um, documents, and in these documents, we have also quite a lot of information, which is structured in a language manner, but not according to the information that machines want to understand and we want to extract from this document. So, um, I was hoping that we can discuss which steps can be taken and with the different steps, what kind of um, technologies or type of artificial intelligence can be applied? I have some thoughts. Yeah, uh, okay. Something bigger than what I was on uh, yes. uh, for you to do. And um, I, can I share my screen again? I, do, yeah. I, I want to show you something which hopefully is going to be a little bit less scary, a little bit less abstract than the group. Or 
overview I showed previously. Um, so if I share my screen, and okay. um, So here's a building block of, uh, I mentioned before, and the one of one of um, wanted to show you here is very very simple. Mouse is a use my screen not there. Okay, it's a very very um, uh, uh, simple model where this particular building block is built on this concept called a feature model. Okay, um, the feature model has got a few little moving parts on it. Uh, this is GeoJSON, uh, JSON link. Okay, so um, just for everybody, feature feature, ma uh, feature model in this context is object. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's a, not the feature like in a remote sensing or processing or image processing, where the feature can be a yeah point or edge or whatever. It's a, it's a thing with properties. Yeah. Um, and in the geospatial world, there's usually some typical properties. But one of the ways we're looking at this is actually having these links between features as part of its first class properties. So there was, but this, this comes from the schema world. This is what I wanted to, to, to touch base on. If I look at the source here, the schema block here is, it's, uh, it's this general feature thing that everybody uses, but the set of properties come from this. It comes from the smart data models from the smart cities community, and they define a schema. So they say that um, uh, this, this particular one here case is an airport and it has an IATA code and an ITKO code and a name. Very, very simple. There's one of the published, it's a published schema, published data model, a published class from a community that publishes a few hundred of these things. And there are many such communities who publish this. If we look at industry foundation classes, we've got you know, a few hundred of those. And then within that, there will be control vocabularies like you know, terminology glossaries, which um, uh, which will define another you know, few thousands of things. Um, but the bottom line is there is already these things out there in the world. So these are the potential semantic groundings of your ontologies. You don't have to reinvent these wheels. There's people out there with data who describe using these things. They may not be perfect. And uh, again, now you're looking at elephant and you care how many years and what color skin it is and not what its internal organs are or whatever and somebody else has that problem um so we're going to have these real world things with these many different views of on them uh, but, but they're all described differently the, the the smart cities people have a bunch of json schemas someone else will have a, you know, a bunch of class models someone else have a, an esri js you know, geodatabase with a whole bunch of feature types in them so there's this heterogeneity, but nevertheless, they exist. So one of the first things we can do is we can... But it, uh, it, and just, uh, I want to just to jump here and say, your JSON is kind of, and uh, JSON is kind of standardized language for representing data. It's a, it's a schema language. Schema and, language, and exactly. For, for JSON data. Now, there are other schema languages, it seems like yeah. that CDF and so forth. Um, but, but the one why this is particularly interesting... But, the thing is that you can have also a lot of this kind of information in spreadsheets. Yes. And this is exactly what Mari, for example, is going to have a lot of information in spreadsheets. Yeah. And so, and, and in fact, there, well, it's not, again, there's a lot of threads. There's another, there's a pathway directly from spreadsheets into a JSON yes. implementation. But the next part I want to mention, which is semantic uplift, which is the semantic annotation of schemas. And that's what the building blocks up I've been going on about is actually one of the key features. It allows us to say um, uh, that you know, all these aspects of a, of a feature map, and you can say it's kind of complicated. But if I look at if I look at the uh, the source code here, it's actually um, it's basically pulls in the source code from directly from the smart data models. They basically have a JSON LD context. They give us these URIs that tell us what each of these pieces mean. Okay? But they don't know anything about how a feature is structured. And if I apply that to a feature, I get nothing. So the building blocks allow us to join those two pieces together because they're building on each other. It's the Lego stick sticking together. So this so when we when we follow the schema relationships, we can then build the JSON LD context that works for that particular schema. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we've inherited the semantic annotations from the original data model, and we um, we now have a data model which is 
um, uh, a schema which can be exported using the standardized OGC API features API. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to define a new API for this. Okay. okay. So, this, so this is blooming together three layers, APIs, schemas, and the semantic layer. But it's actually, and this is really the first time it's been done, and we've actually been working with a JSON schema and JSON LD work groups and so forth. And I know that we're the first people really who have actually done this. And that's and that's going through this business of being able to walk the schemas, semantic annotated, and then build these relatively complicated JSON LD contexts so that my examples, and the testing is critical in all this, you can put examples in here, and the JSON LD is trivial. It just basically says that here's the context. And there's the RDF, there's the knowledge graph version of that data. And it's testable. Um, and if I just go do one and final. JSON LD is something to do with large language. No, no, it's, it's, it's another, just another standard technology. No, but what's behind? How the JSON LD is, no, it, it, it's a specification which is uh, implemented by many, many people, Google and so forth, um, for semantic annotation JSON, JSON schemas. But it basically converts. So the key thing is you have all those spreadsheets or schemas or that little thing out there which live out there in the real world, which are not semantic enabled, are just little structures which people may or may not have agreed on. Hundreds of thousands of them, lots of ways of coming them by. It allows us to bring them into the knowledge graph model. Okay, in a systematic way, a testable way. And that's this testing. Okay. This is all managed in a GitHub repository that, that, that automates the testing. So this one, um, if I go to the, um, the GitHub repository, we'll see here's the validation report for this that it knows that that test basically, that this is very straightforward. But we can also have tests for, um, we can also have tests for uh, more complicated things. Um, and so this particular case, you see it's actually picked up Shackle, which is logical tests from the observations building block. That one's built on. So it's this ability to test as you go, bite off little bits at a time and reuse stuff which is there, is, a, is I believe, a potential game changer. It means that instead of having to build a massive ontology in Protege and then no one else will ever understand what it means, we now have these little pieces which can be tested systematically, incrementally, these great number of these libraries of building blocks can now be published. Every one of these GitHub repositories built its own little library, which could be aggregated into a bigger library. So you can do it a little bit by little bit, test it as you go. And I'm just going to find one final thing if I go to the, um, uh, the profiles for, um, if I go to the profiles for um, uh, the, the 3D Cadaster. 3D Cadaster. Sorry, I was. Just, just jump to this one. Um, just go to WA, for example. Um, and I look at the validation report for, for that. Um, and I'm, well, um, I, I pick an example here. Um, you can sort of see it's in, in here, it's inherited. All the all the rules from all the underlying building blocks. So this is quite a sophisticated thing, but the actual Western Australian profile. When I go back to it, um, if I look at the building block, uh, you know, it just it is a profile which adds the vocabularies to this thing. Look at the full. It's inherited all those underlying building blocks, and the validation report for the examples. For this, basically, you have, now these are the these are all the different validation rules which are, are automatically inherited. So, I guess this is now just reiterating what I was saying. I believe one of the starting points is I think that a lot of the existing starting points in terms of existing data models that people use, if you can work out those ones which are well curated and broken down, okay, and you have now, then this is a this is a potential pathway for bringing that into knowledge graph land. In a systematic modular way. Mm. And then your knowledge graph is going to be made of pieces that you can identify what's common. You don't, you're not, you're not building those knowledge graphs from scratch. And I think you could have now, I mean, I'm going to throw a vision here, which is collectively, you could build the libraries of your building blocks that your, and each of your projects is actually adding, okay, oh, it's a building block for transport, it's a building block for tunnels. Next person comes along with tunnels, okay, here's some tunnels. 
if it is that based on any standard? Well, if it is, it's going to be visible because there's a direct reference to the standard, and you can see what standard that tunnel model was built on. Uh, um, you know, um, the, that transparency of how things are, that ability to build up library solutions and the ability to integrate them, which is your Lego, you know, this is your Lego concept. You know, the same sort of size the, the, the mobs and the poles fit together, you can you can join them up and then you can you can test your structures incrementally and you can start sharing solutions rather than generating um, now what we're doing at the moment we have so many you know, people doing great work but so little value is being extracted from the collective work in fact the more people are doing it the harder it is to find things and it's almost like the less value each individual piece has i think we need to have a step change a start seeing something bigger than some of the parts emerging um, but it also means that then there's you know, no one has to solve every problem at once they can just start reusing libraries of solutions and there is something very interesting here because you say about special schema and that is the path to get where they combine all these modules but some of these standards and you suggest that you have to start in the standard because this is visible what is going to happen there. Uh, and in this case, this is very interesting because there's not such a special schema for the tunnel maintenance. And in a way, that's why from the standard, there is a standard for tunnel, but it's text, all text information. And first, he has to process the text, create the knowledge graph, and probably create a special schema. And after that, he can provide a module that can be uh, used here to be connected with everything else. But you will find there are already ontologies for asset management, okay? And there are already ontologies for the very, the various pieces, okay? Within, let's take a tunnel as an example. It's going to be an asset. It's also potentially going to be part of, a, for example, a transport network. So there'll be at least two different models, which you might want to say was, and then there's going to be the various monitoring that you want to do, there's going to be relevant models for that, okay? Then there's going to be, um, uh, um, yeah, of note, models for risk, there's, all, all, there's many different aspects depending on what you need to model. Yeah. So if you start off from scratch, you have to think about all those aspects and what you create, well, only you will understand. But if you're able to start and say, well, here's the various different standards, let me see if I can build a model of the tunnel I need by joining together those bits of standards. Let's, let's connect that one to that one. Let's create a schema which pulls those properties in from there and those properties in from there. Okay. And, and again, the, the, um, I know I'm, yeah, I've got a hammer and everything looks like a nail, but keeping track of where the pieces come from, this is where the semantic world has failed and why we don't all know how to do it today. It's because everybody has brought all this stuff into project in a big file and they don't record where it comes from. And therefore, no one can look at that model and understand it. They may be able to look at the namespaces and, and assume you haven't changed it. There's nothing to say you haven't. You could have added new things to it, which is inconsistent. Um, uh, but generally speaking, you, know, you don't. You, most of those times, you'll see a URI and you go to it and you won't be able to find that URI won't resolve. You won't be able to find the underlying ontology. I've done a lot of work with a lot of domains. I mean, that's my role. You know, we work across. You know, Every domain is geospatial. But I know I've done data modeling for work with uh, 400 different domains, and every single one has the same pattern. They have a model and they say things are standardized, but you can't actually see where things come from. You can't actually um, do that. So I think the gap between what we do and the pathology graph you like to talking about, which is where AI can start exploiting it, um, is unnecessarily big. And I reckon we can come up with a strategic incremental approach to attacking problems, which you know, it's not necessarily just it's all about this. I think it's just generally a mindset about uh, problems based. You know, uh, you know, how do you share the reusable pieces? Let's think about FAIR, you know, the FAIR principles for you know, the, your, your units of research effort. You know, uh, the FAIR principle? The findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. Uh, very commonly uh, used as a sort of high level, uh, how to do things better. But 
but let's think about it in terms of the unit of research effort and, and your potential for impact. Is your research going to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable? And, I, uh, and then at the, low, now at the technical level, I can help you, but it's still, it's still a mindset for how you prosecute um, uh, your work where you say, actually, there's a lot of common challenges. You all go away and come up with a different solution. Um, I mean, it is, it is hard. You, you're not going to get to a perfect solution where everybody coordinates, because even learning how to do that is a big job. No one's going to be able to do it. But I think there's, at least you can start making some of it um, consistent. I mean, like just standardizing vehicles. Well, let's, let's, let's standardize you know, the EC2 plug that goes, and then the, you, you can do diagnostics for your car, okay? Standardize because someone forced that. That's a complicated thing. Standardize light bulbs in your car. You don't have to standardize the whole car. But which parts of your pole can you start agreeing on standards when you can start reusing things, even internally? Okay, and then you'll start learning internally and then be able to share the external understanding of standards better. Because that's a huge job, understanding what's out there. You know, it's, and that's basically what people say, oh, it's too hard, I'll reinvent the wheel. But you know, I think if you can find ways of sharing your evaluation and knowledge of what's out there and reusable by showing how you've reused it, then that's, I think that will then give everybody else you know, uh, um, a, a better cadence, a better, a more scalable approach. And Hank, what do you think? Is this something <coughs> think is going to work with this architecture? And, uh, well, that's what we try. So, so it's, it's, it's anything that's a JSON editor? Well, I mean, JSON is a technology. The building block approach is actually agnostic. We can use it for yeah. null models. We can use it for IFC classes. It doesn't actually matter. It's just that we've done a lot of work with JSON because we have the, the connection between the model and the semantic, between the schema and the semantics. And it's simply it's built in. It's been used better. And, and, and enough people are using it. But, uh, I mean, it would be a sensible place to start. But in the second thing with the API first, API. Well, there are already APIs that will support features. You don't have to think about the APIs, and you're just building you're building payloads for the existing APIs this way, not um, not reinventing the wheels. I think the transfer building sector was work very very well. I've seen this morning uh, a video clip that um, was recorded from the beginning of June from the next Dev conference in London. And they demonstrated on that project with different software providers through an API first, just JSON Exchange or JSON Editing Platform, and how people could work together um, in a project that they're going to use you through the your IP and the project that we could work together and just link it to you on it. To you on. So, what we been trying to do with the second project with the ARC, with the CFC project, is to link that all to a manufacturing process where. At the end, you have to give them the machinist to understand some constraints of how to navigate through other building components and um, rebar system, windows, and that kind of thing. But it always should be a software driven approach, um, not a hardware approach. So I can see quite clearly what you've been doing here in that 50 minutes I was listening to you as a, as a very valid uh, contribution to the issues we would see in the construction with the rhino sectors. Yeah, it's a tool you can apply yeah. to systematically attacking that problem. Yeah. That's, that's what it is. And I pretty much like the idea to just say, well, oh, here's the, the biggest kind of problem ever. And we try to solve it, just look into a small kind of component, making sure that it has a small component is working um, in isolation, and then you can build up your innovation on that. Um, any innovation in virtual is a layer of innovation. It's just going to use, you know, what did you invent? Well, not the payment system, not the banking system, it's just a business model. They so just layer your information on top. And I think that's the, the beauty of software, that you can do that. Uh, it's just quite often forgotten in research circles where you always think you have to reinvent and innovate something completely fresh instead of building on existing knowledge. So when we're looking in, in the research project with in particular, um, on, on the encouragement model of you know, encouraging you know, this kind of people to say, well, I've got some research and now it's working. How can I contribute my research to the bigger kind of research? What incentive is there? But one in incentive, of course, would be money. So if I have a certain tool and I'm going to use your tool for a certain period of time or for a certain quantity, um, what is the payment system that allows you 
I use your tool for commercial content. How can you monetize for, for your research um, that enables you to further develop your tool, maintain your tool? And this can also be the basis is in the blockchain because you know the data, where they come from, what is their content, and what is built on top of it. Exactly. So you can establish your I gave you something and I'm just going to wash my hands clear that whatever. When I gave you something, it's working. What you're going to do now is your problem. It's a blockchain. It is, it is the method model for one aspect of it, which is sort of the non repudiation. And the, um, but ultimately, you, know, you still have to have a payload inside the blockchain. Um, and then you have to understand what's inside the block. That you know, yes, you, you can now trust the block, but you still also have to understand it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and so, not solving all the problems at once. But these these things are, um, you know, uh, it, 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 it's it's really about bringing the best practices we've learned from software forever and bringing it to data modeling, mm -hmm. which is you know unit testing, um, and libraries. I mean, software libraries in general are not the things you monetize. Okay, if the application you build on top of. So, but then it's a question of who's going to build and publish the software libraries to make them reusable. So, and once we say, okay, you know, we know we've got um, a whole bunch of uh, um, models for managing, um, you know, uh, learn looking at assets and risks and so forth. All these low level pieces that you want to reuse, you're probably not going to be able to monetize those because you want to standardize those with a wider community. But building your application, which Exploit those to get further, faster, and better. Mm. Um, that it's a For example, when you identify yourself as a software and you want to identify yourself and um, registration system, you've got a, a Google or a Facebook or an Apple kind of a registration system which is a block that you don't really have to develop by yourself anymore for your software. Um, a payment system, you know, with PayPal and credit card systems and so on. So, so these are just developed, and yes, they're not really nobody monetizes them because the companies behind them are so big, so they're making their money else. But if you're in your own little entity that wants to develop something, I think the, the aspect of um, maintaining the software through a monetized system is quite attractive because software maintenance costs money. The, the problem of software development is not developing the software, it's developing a business model that you can just yeah, sell your system and pay for the maintenance of the system. And I think particularly in academic circles, you know, that's a big problem. You develop a software of research, it's working hooray, the funding stops um, and the whole kind of development stops and just goes back into oblivion because nobody pays the software. Yeah. So for the maintenance of the software. <laughs> so the reality is software tends to be short-lived. Data for information, you know, governance processes for information and other things which can last longer, and so that they they need a lot more long term investment strategy, um, and uh, but also the, the data uh, and technology come and go in that cycle, and so um, uh, I don't know how the people you're talking with um, with uh, Oren and they are talking about reusable analytics, cloud services, and so forth. Again, how they monetize this is another thing. But the point is, you can only have reusable analytics, whether it's a software library you have locally or whether it's in the cloud, if you can clearly characterize what the inputs are. And there's always this gap between this the data which is available and this is the inputs the analytics need, and you've got work to do. And now understanding how to do that at a scalable level, that's what that's what 85 percent or so of geospatial or AI work is done. It's actually turning the data. And the form is in in a form you need it to run the algorithm you, you, you understand or you want to test. So that all the work's going in there, and nearly all that work is being done and then wasted. And I think we can do a lot better in terms of actually understanding what are the component information models, what are the component analytical processes, um, uh, what happened there, um, uh, you know, what is it that, um, you know, Collectively, would make you more efficient and able to have a higher value product at the end of the day, which is more likely to have impact or monetary value or whatever. At the moment, if you're reinventing all the wheels, you'll never get far enough. You'll achieve things with a lot of value. But if you, 
And it's like if you build a house and you have to go out there and start chopping trees down and make all the wood yourself, then you're not going to make a very big house. But if you go and buy all the materials and a plan and you put it all together, you can build a house in six weeks. Okay? And instead of build a shed in a hut in six years. And that's that's, that's, that, that's just the scalability um, challenge that I think we're still very early days. We have huge growth for, for improvement in our scalability and our efficiency. Okay, so shall we go back to the topic of this workshop about artificial intelligence and deep learning and all this technology? Uh, so when I wrote to you, I wanted to see Okay, the problems, clear specification of the problem that you want to solve, and why, um, how do you, how do you consider that artificial intelligence would help in solving this problem? So, can I make some kind of round again between the presenters and to just with few sentences say, okay, the problem was it's this or that. And I think artificial intelligence is going to help me. Ah. And after that, of course, we already know that for some of these uh, networks, you need to have a lot of data to be able to train the data. So my impression is that not all problems can be solved, on, even only because it's very difficult either to collect this kind of data, even to simulate this kind of data. So, um, yeah, is it true what I'm thinking? Is it how is the, how is your problem? Let's start from you because, yeah, because you have already quite a lot of uh, ideas about what you want to do, and your problem is. Quite clear. You have a tunnel, you want to monitor the maintenance of the tunnel, and you want in some way to be sure that at a certain moment you have to check specific components of the tunnel, either the structure or the internal equipment, or I don't know what. Uh, yeah, it's, I think in the past year of my uh, first uh, PhD period, and what I'm trying to seek is to find a connection between the technology of like different kind of AI technology and the real problems in the tunnel field. It's so like because uh, But why do you think that the, the technology that you are looking into is going to help in this problem? Uh, yeah, uh, actually what is really important is not about the technology itself, it's about the practical problem. Yeah. In, uh, in the actual scenario. And uh, uh, there are some of the important pro uh, problems that need to be solved, including such as uh, uh, limited data. And, uh, and let me take this kind of practical problem as an example. Uh, we all know that in real scenario, the data is not enough. Uh, uh, it's not balanced. And uh, it's uh, quality is not good enough, the quantity is not enough for training the model. And there are some existing technologies in AI field, such as the field short learning, such as uh, compositive learn, uh, learning, this kind of technology that can deal with this kind of scenario. And that helps to train a uh, uh, like domain knowledge graph or domain information extraction model. So I think uh, that can be viewed as a, a usage example of like how you all think of AI to solve the practical problems. But this is not the question. The question is what the problem is and why this problem needs artificial intelligence. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, because now what you are answering, is what you are trying to do, you say, I want to solve something with artificial intelligence, but I don't have enough data. And that's why I am looking for approaches that can provide me with a lot of data. So are you solving the real tunnel problem or you are solving the problem of how to train a network for a tunnel purposes? So uh, these are two different problems, right? Yeah. Uh, how should I answer that? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I have to admit that there are some problems that 
is beyond the tunnel domain that may be uh, common in other domain, not just related and not just limited in tunnel field. Uh, so your problem is not exactly the tunnel, your problem is limited data for training. Uh, it it comes in this way, it comes in this way. <laughs> I think that could be the just try to jump in and add some comments. That could be the, the fun, you know, a common generic issue with limited data. I mean, anyway, that's the problem everybody else will be facing. Okay. And then immediately you need to look at the AI algorithm, which is able to handle the problem with limited data. Yeah, but what kind of problem is solved? Yes. And then at the moment, uh, for Jack, I think you're not able to solve all the problem for asset management. That's the reason. He chose, you know, we have chosen the tunnel as like a, a test bed or as a case study, and then to develop because otherwise, different application, different uh, like civil infrastructure, the standard regulations could be quite different, and then we have to start from somewhere, sort of try to test and develop okay. methods. Yeah. Okay, but I was thinking that the problem is similar. I'm thinking that the problem is. People that are expected inspecting tunnels, mm -hmm, yeah. they have to read the manuals. And reading the manuals, they walk with the paper around or with their uh, tablets and look and inspect. Mm -hmm, yeah. And I was thinking, this is the problem. Instead of people going inside the tunnel, reading documents and trying to look around to see what is happening, why not machines are doing this? Instead of people going inside, a robot goes inside, collects either images or point clouds, and there is another machine that reads the manuals, and after that, bridges the two um, type of um, machine uh, processing what is happening with the tunnel and what is happening with documents, brings them to back together and says, okay, I found some cracks here and here. Maybe this is the problem. Not that we don't have enough data. Okay, uh, I understand that. Uh, but that's very important. But uh, I won't talk about the machine uh, related stuff because okay. that's, that's a, little, a little related to like hardware or the robotics. So yeah, that's not that's all of my domain right now. Uh, but when I'm solving the problem, when I solve the problems in the tunnel field, uh, when I develop uh, like a Deep learning framework or machine learning framework. I'm not just solving some of the common problem uh, that is uh, existing in other field. Uh, what what what? How do I determine the framework or how do I determine the architecture? It highly related to the problem just existing in tunnels. It just happened to that the data in the tunnel is not enough. But our framework have some other other additional functions that is. Uh, maybe not exist in other field. For example, uh, to capture the the semantic uh, features of the standards in the tunnel field. Th this is not uh, not the same as like other uh, data limitations in like the point cloud. So, so that's 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 is a unique uh, unique uh, that's a unique problem just in tunnel field or the domain knowledge graph. So okay. yeah, so the way we Combine the different kind of intelligence to gather that. Sure. Okay, now it's, it's not the problem. Who wants to be the next? Can I just take a comment? Because I've actually done something very similar with, um, with a, a, another regulation where, I mean, currently people have a big PDF and 600 pages of regulation, and, and you search for something and you'll find. Um, something relatively common and find 5,000 hits and you want it in context to your particular thing, okay? Um, so precision and recall to actually find the relevant regulations for the context you're looking at is extremely low with, with documentation alone. And we use actually a lot of the same you know, similarities um, and you know, we, a whole range of things like also training it by um, so when you ask a question, they will give you a series of answers, and you say, well, actually, this is a good. This was a good answer to my question, and the system remembers that. So now you've got so you've got learning as well. Um, so you end up with uh, frequently asked questions, and you end up with so things like um, when you have common concepts 
in a in a regulation that you know, maybe the most important section is the one with the table or you know, maybe have a section with a table and an image and then it's been cross-referenced for multiple other sections you know which is, and so we, we use a combination of semantic reasoning and machine learning and so forth just to say actually and we could dramatically improve by about two orders of magnitude of precision and recall um, you know, to find the relevant bit of regulation for the context you're looking at. You then combine that with other layers of image recognition and picture. Now, this this is the thing. Um, therefore, this is you know, this is what I need to be looking for. I mean, that's it's a big problem to know how you can change these things together. But I think there's a you know, having the 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 combination of the semantic of the domain that's what sort of things you're looking at and the semantics of the structure of the um, the problem space in this case it might be a regulatory compliance. Uh, joining those two together is a is a big enough challenge and uh, pretty worthy a good thing to be doing. So I mean I think you're in a good so you're in a sensible place there. Um, um, but uh, you know, to make the thing reusable uh, the idea is that well you actually have your live view domain semantics and you have your then you have potentially many, many regulations and and I think you start off with one and you can do a bunch of NLP techniques with Berlin. But over time, you could also build richer training sets by having looked at many regulations and many data sources. <laughs> and you know, the thing could potentially grow over time, but you can only start with one or two of these pieces. Mm. So, yeah. yeah. Mm. yeah. I feel like the, the library is um, it's called artificial intelligence because we are looking at how to uh, simulate or replace human intelligence. That's the whole point of the artificial intelligence. So, um, look at how human is going to distract the terminal to be thinking of um, work. Then we use artificial thinking. I understood the patient, but I was thinking using um, this is scenario, I'm thinking you're proposing something. Uh, I uh, should read all the uh, regulations or uh, how to check uh, the and that machine will learn. And then replace human work. Uh, so I was thinking in that case, that's a very good point because we are looking at how to use the machine to replace. Uh, Human being. So that's, uh, I think, this is the question is that uh, why do you think artificial intelligence is a bad way to solve the problem? And then you can say, okay, you know, I use this to try that machine to work as a human. But, but I, don't, I don't think it's feasible to go because I think you've got three layers of sort of big problems you have to solve before you can get that. Just even identifying which regulations match the features you're looking at. There's enough role for artificial intelligence in that process before you start thinking about whether you can um, uh, uh, actually make a decision. So I think I think the human judgment is that uh, there, there is there is a you know, um, now identification analysis uh, uh, and, and, and judgment, and then of course there's the whole monitoring of effectiveness and all the other layers. It's the first thing of you probably need to use layers of artificial intelligence in different times. Even just to know that you're talking about a relevant regulation for the relevant feature, you can get that up and running. Then it's a foundation you can do the next. But I think we're a long way mm -hmm. from absolutely replacing the human in the loop because it makes the human more efficient. Yeah, sure, sure. But as you said at the beginning, start from something yeah. small. You can start yeah. from one standard, build something, and after the next standard. Then after that, start yeah. deciding which of these standards are going to be our regulations. Are going to be, but this is always in the direction that we want to go. Yeah, and the uh, PhD student need to Yeah, we use machine learning. There were different uh, levels of stages. At the beginning, we used a rule based system, which basically were all the model out of the PhD. So, for the situation, we do all these rules in the rule version, and then the machine will do the things. And then there were uh, machine learning, which is a more smarter. Now we look at the natural language, generic AI. That's that's actually what I think can be called AI. Not 
now everybody is reaching out, but in some cases, it's actually not, not AI yet. I think now we just want to use these trending words. Um, so I think that's that's important. What do you think? Do they exist in the machine learning or actually in the development of AI? To me, generic AI is beyond me, um, but I think that's that, that level of it, we're still going like to human thinking. Then they will be able to identify, oh, this is something I read and I know whether to apply this one to solve this problem. Um, but of course, that's, that's really high level, and I have no idea how to implement it. Yeah. Can we go to some other case, another problem? Your problem. Me? Yeah. <clears throat> or she. She. <laughs> she. <laughs> 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 Oh, there is, uh, yeah. You are very ambitious. <laughs> um, I guess for me, it's basically uh, deep learning has done well in identifying features in images. That is 2D learning. It segmentizes the data, understands the patterns well, the complex features like edges and all. It it detects. Actually, well. what kind of problem are you going? I'm planning to solve. Uh. The main thing that I will focus yeah. on is 3D reconstruction. Uh -huh. uh, semantic segmentation is one of the parts in it. So overall, uh, if that process is improved, the previous steps are improved, then 3D re reconstruction might be improved. So deep learning would help in, I guess, the previous steps more. And then 3D reconstruction would require a bit of human intervention, like assigning rules, spatial relations, or something it might require. So yeah, that that is, I guess, why deep learning might help in yeah. basically identifying features or segmenting, uh, understanding the patterns of the point cloud data. It, it does a really good job with handling large amounts of data, so. But actually, what you're doing. Yes. With trying to figure out that reconstruct something from unstructured data to point policies yes. is actually the other part of his research that he is not supposed, even it's not necessary to complete, where I'm saying you have the tunnel and you do the scanning and after that you try to figure out some features and you can train the point clouds to recognize specific features. At the moment, you are busy with the walls and yes. the windows and the doors, but you also can train to find out where the cracks are in the tone. Yes, you can yes. do that, yes. Yeah. But again, then the label data becomes an issue. Of course, training. Of course yes. you have to adapt something. But going in this direction, what is the problem and how it's going to be solved and why deep learning or artificial intelligence is uh, appropriate method. So for you, it's some kind of obvious because you have a lot of data yes. and you can train yes. and you can adapt the labeling or you even you can try to have to figure out <coughs> networks which use as little as possible labeling data set to be able to train. Yes. And after that combining your research with his research on language, large language modeling, you'll get to something that can replace the person, as she said. <laughs> or probably one, two more PhD students working in the same company. Use artificial intelligence to automate that process. Uh, yes, one of the one of the process is that, but the next process is actually the reconstruction, wherein I want to generate a model in the end, a 3D model thing. So that is also one of the main points. Semantic segmentation is just a part of it. Then I, I might improve the existing models or create a complete. You I think that that's really helpful because I think my understanding is now, um, you know, laser scanning is not a problem for the cloud, but labeling or categorize them, identifying that's a, that's a big job. And so, even bigger yeah. job, you should be reconstruction up. Yeah. 
because when mm -hmm. you have a segmented point cloud, you still don't have much. That's right. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, we need to then automate the process to set up the screening for them. Yes. It, if you are PHP can't shoot that, that's amazing. Let me know. Yeah, I, I think that's a, actually, I believe there was someone else already also working on that because that's obviously a really um, yes. demand area. You know, if we really want to use the point cloud data, uh, then this is a, this is a must. Yeah, it is, this area is, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a while that people are working on this area. And it is well advanced in terms of being able to classify points and identify, say, that this is this group of features, et cetera. But I think the, the bottleneck is that conversion of that into maps or models. That is where still many of the software tools or practices are very much, they depend on human. To, to trace those classified objects and convert them to, to maps. So that is where, where the actual uh, uh, problem is. Although within the, in some domains, for example, if we talk about outdoors, you can identify vegetation, you can identify buildings with a pretty good accuracy. Uh, but when it comes to particularly construction application and interiors of the buildings and progress in the construction, then even classification of the features, like if this is a window as opposed to a wall or as opposed to a, a door, that is still uh, is not well well progressed. So even the classification and segmentation is is not very advanced. Yeah, yeah, and and AI can can certainly help deep learning. But I guess going back to uh, CC's comment in in all of these research projects. Um, we need to be mindful that LLM, DL, uh, AI, etc. These are just tools, okay? And these are uh, solutions. The pitfall for PhDs um, is that you fix on a solution and you try to solve a problem with a solution that may not be suitable. That is very that is very dangerous in in doing PhD, as all of you are at the early stages. So try not to fall in love with your solution, fall in love with your problem. Try to uh, look at exactly what this is that I am solving and then uh, find the appropriate solution. Um, otherwise, I mean, I'm sure there will be a PhD out of it, but the impact of PhD may not be as big as if you, if you know your problem better and identify the right solution for it. So, it's these are hot topics. Uh, everyone talking, even in the news. So people are talking AI at home. In sort of, it's a uh, household uh, term. Uh, so we should be very careful not to fall into that trap. They, not, they may not be your solutions. Solution may be a sort of yeah. other things, simpler things. Yeah. Yeah, but folks, more than the AI, they try to use AI regardless, but actually AI may not be the best tool to solve this problem. Yeah. So you first you need to just know why AI is the best way to resolve this problem. So that that's very important. Money. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know, uh, now listening to this discussion, yeah. with your opinion, do you have a good problem that can be solved with AI? You know, uh, I, I was doing great with linear algorithms to solve my own problems when I found myself into a complicated one. And then I started, okay, uh, to think, uh, your tools that you've been doing for many years uh, is not useful anymore. So you, you need to find a way. Can you give an example? Sorry that that is a little bit. Yeah, an for example, example uh, uh, I developed a tool to optimize a facade uh, in terms of uh, controlling waste material. And uh, the algorithm works like this. A design firm, for example, 
Rhino would go through the algorithm and it starts to mix and match different shapes on the facade to give you some, you know, uh, scoring base of your design. This is a linear and simple, you know, algorithm that can actually be applied in many cases, uh, especially when it, when the facade is just, you know, Euclidean and uh, it's not complicated. And uh, we actually got a project for uh, a complex structure, uh, which wasn't, you know, it was really chaotic. And it was, a, for example, a two, base, two curved uh, objects all over it. And I needed to have the constructability check and environmental analysis to be checked and the standards, building codes. And I found that, okay, you cannot develop an algorithm to mix and match all of these like the way you did. And I started to search about different algorithms and I found out, okay, uh, maybe machine learning can give you some example or better say, uh, you know, training set. And then uh, things come uh, get along after, after each other. And I found that deep learning, and I'm talking about four or five years of experience within this kind of stuff. And now with the PhD project, I, I know that the, the problem is really complicated and with different layers, different contexts, and you need an algorithm to, you know, be trained to find out the paradigm of data. And when it, when it comes to make decisions in AEC, we have all of these, you know, we need all of these experiences to make a decision. And with different layers, and let, let's just talk about the structure of any kind of uh, ANN. With different layers of data, you may find your decision, you know, going from top of the layer one, lower of the layer two, and something like this, exploring decisions into different layers came to my mind uh, as a solution. Uh, and that is why I'm trying to find uh, AI for solving it. So in a way, you have already a lot of parameters. Exactly. And the connection and you, between them is really important. Want to quick, um, in a more efficient way, estimate all the combination of all these parameters that Exactly. Might be there. Efficient in the terms of the speed and, of course, fast uh, decision making, low important decision making. All of them can actually be applied in a training model. Can I can I ask you a question like this? Then, so you say that your first problem or first sets of problem could be solved in a linear methods. Now, now you have more more parameters and more complex situation. Why not using nonlinear mathematical models for that? Mm. No, sometimes it's not face to face moving through projects. When it comes to industry, they uh, the, there are plenty of you know checkpoints, and that uh, the you know uh, parameters are not coming from your uh, objects and attributes that you can actually deal with them. I mean, uh, for example, a client would say something that is uh, not parametric, and uh, you, you need to add it, for example, with, with uh, like an NLP model to find a way to connect these data types together. It's not related to just having a 3D object and an attribute among them. And uh, in those cases, you cannot find a way to go for nonlinear algorithm. You need to have different inputs from different contexts. But, I mean, I understand the industry practical issues, but in terms of your PhD, at the end of the day, you're going to translate it into a number of parameters that you're going to deal with in, in your PhD. So that question that clients ask, I need this, you you will translate it into a, some sort of variable in your equations to be able to solve it. So let's put that aside, what the client says. There will be an interpretation of what client says in in terms of a, a variable in your in your modeling. So you still, if you translate that to one feature, then you will have multiple uh, variables that you can use nonlinear equations uh, rather than necessarily using NLP. In face to face, solving problem would would work, but uh, we do not know what parameter from one factor. Uh, is connected to the other part of the, from the other factor. AI can solve this. It, it can find patterns that we can ask. You see. But then it's related to, again, the training. 
And the file comes to data. And data, yeah. And data, data, data. Yeah, exactly. And data what is, you find the data? It's the common problem for every. No, but user. it's not a common problem because you can go in another way. You can try to develop a network that uses less data. And you can also try to have um, simplified the kind of solution, linear or non-linear solution, but flow solution. And you can simulate a lot of synthetic data and after that train uh, artificial intelligence or deep learning with the purpose just to make the computations quicker. So, uh, in your case, how are you going to get the data? And if you don't have the data, then what? Is it the possibility to go and look for a, another solution? Like yeah, having yeah, this kind of yeah, yeah well, I think it's group based yeah. solution, closed solution, and try to uh, adapt the parameters, kind of decision support system. That's that's actually my, my question too, uh, because I'm not focused on the tools at the moment. Uh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> the tools are there. We can search about different, you know, uh, models and different train and hugging face, find some some solution eventually. But uh, I think the biggest problem is to conceive this kind of, you know, or better say, conceptualize the whole thing, and that that's the biggest issue that I'm tr struggling with at the moment. So I think the the problem definition in your case is is very. Very important. I think it's yeah. good that you have the industry background. So, uh, but trying to, this is the issue of elephant, trying to uh, sort of by piece by piece. So, that is, that's very really important. So, uh, because when I saw your decarbonization of AEC, I mean, I've done research uh, on the construction based uh, demolition based not construction only demolition based and there are many parameters many uh, variables there just to understand the demolition base in terms of in terms of what's involved that data beam etc now I'm looking at that research after a few years uh, we have this looking at the carbon emission from them. So we now have, I can see sort of gaps in terms of how the rest of the construction process fit to that. So we only looked at in isolation. Now you have many processes and each will have a lot of, uh, like it's broad and also deep. And so you need to be careful. Or I mean, the, it's the, it's the dilemma here is, are we looking at, if we look at only one aspect, then we we miss. That's what we did. We miss the rest of it. Uh, but we look at everything, and then we lose the depth of it. So that is. I believe uh, the outcome of this research would be just a specific part of the whole picture. Okay. But we need to find out which part. Okay. So. Somebody of you who wants to speak about the problem that brought to be solved? Oh, yes, I see. You? Okay. Yes, so, I think the uh, important problem is to uh, in how to collect data. Yeah. In, about my res uh, research. Uh, uh, and uh, I also want, uh, want to know uh, before I mentioned, uh, before. Uh, many sensors, I think I mentioned, uh, what other sensors uh, can be used in my research? I think uh, mm, not many sensors, so I need to choose one sensor to be used in my research. But as I know, uh, you want to monitor traffic in, um, drivers and uh, machine operators. But I, I believe that there is already these kind of systems, specifically for uh, truck drivers. 
What kind of devices do they use to monitor? Uh, I think, uh, uh, I mean, there is uh, or drivers. I think uh, I'm not interested in doing some research on drivers. Uh -huh. I, I think uh, we can uh, do, uh, have some uh, outcomes uh, or operators rather than uh, on drivers. Okay. So operators that are sitting in front of computer screens. Yes. Uh, yeah, this kind of operators. So they should be told that the plant operator the plant or machine also is too much drivers. Do they sit at the screen or they are they, uh, manipulating they, a machine? Yeah, the machine operators. Drivers. drivers, yeah. yeah. They not are the truck driver, not the truck driver, it could be the excavator drivers. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. 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 In, in, in your research, I mean, uh, you said that uh, because we can't collect data in Australia, we go collect data for another country. I think if you turn it and look at the other way, so we have some privacy issue in, in here for collecting the data for the operators. So that's a research problem in its own. So how we can address that? How we can how can we collect data uh, in yeah in the construction space that we don't invade the privacy of the operators people so that can be a valid good research problem. I'm not sure if people have done research in this. I have it's not my area, uh, but that is a problem. It's an interesting problem. I think we had this discussion with Johnson in another project we had, and that's you raised that issue. So. So I know they use AI to actually detect people's movement. Um, you know, old people to see how likely they are to fall. Mm. And apparently a really subtle thing that humans can pick up. Yeah. They can actually pick up and predict sort of fall risk. But um but even without sort of um, biometric monitoring, I was wondering whether you could look at the uh, the, the people's reactions and the and the way they move the machine and to see whether there are patterns in there. I mean, I guess there there possibly a whole bunch of Operational sensors themselves, which may be secondary signals for behavior. Um, but, uh, again, like you're saying, the AI can find the patterns that humans can't. And maybe um, just even having a look at the range of possible sensors and, and seeing which te techniques pick up any correlations. Yeah, I think the Availability of the data, that's one of the challenges for this research. Not, that's not your research question. Mm -hmm. And especially when you know that you have a very limited time to complete the research, you can spend more than two years trying to figure out where the data are going to come and what kind of data you need. Yes. <laughs> okay, so... Um, Let's put it another way around. Now I'm asking the question. Now, do you have a question? And do you have questions to Rob? So he didn't, he showed something already how it works, but he has quite a lot of tools which might be useful. So please feel free to ask questions. So we can go from his direction. Who wants to ask a question? Ashley. Yes, you haven't said anything and uh, you didn't present anything. You are very new, but <laughs> go ahead. Do you have questions? Um, yeah, I mean, you, what you uh, presented, uh, what you like showed in GitHub is like, um, like a standard going forward, right? Yeah, it's like a framework for building it's a framework. things up from pieces. Yeah, so and I think it's going to be ontology pieces. How does one go using it like? How do you implement it, per se? Well, pretty much like you would with any other problem, you first of all you need to have some sense of what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. Um, and then uh, you would uh, say, all right, well, where are there um, already um, solutions to the type of problems? So, like, we, like, for example, let's take the 3D catastro thing. We know that one of the issues that they have is that, uh, well, that they, that, 
um, uh, they didn't know how to put 3D data into the existing 2D contracts. Okay, um, and then now when you look at it, one of the issues about the 3D data is that um, ultimately it's not all about getting the coordinates and knowing how things relate to each other. So we end up in it, we need the 3D topology model. That's a topic had a problem. Yeah. Um, another thing we did is we knew is that they had um, uh, more and more ways of observing it. Okay. So when they previously had you know, observations for certain types of observations, and now we have new types of observations, okay, but we've got no way to put it. So so okay, there are there are already standards for um, meta models for observations. Okay, so well then that's, so that's a building block that we use. Okay, so there's a sensor observation sampling and um, an actuation ontology, um, the W3C1, the W3C provenance ontology. Not that we need to track what has happened, who has said what about things, and what has changed over time. So these are so a lot of this stuff comes from a lot of experience knowing what standards exist and what people have used and what problems are common. So I think the first thing to do is to look at your problem and say, all right, what is common about my problem and what's unique about my problem? And then well, the common stuff say, all right. Well, let me see if I can find some common solutions for X, Y, Z. And then the particular case here, what we're doing is trying to build up some of the common libraries. So we have OUC APIs, we have a bunch of standards for very, very sort of common problems. I need to deliver a bunch of people who say, give me all the give me all the buildings with um, more than three cat doors or something. And that's a common problem. There are tools like you know. GIS tools support a whole bunch of common problems. So by breaking, by understanding which parts of your solution, your, your problem are just sort of relatively standard things versus which bits, okay, no one really knows how to describe the relationship between, um, you know, the, the um, material of the window and its, and, and its acoustic reflectivity. Okay, I've looked, no one's so I'm going to have to model that part myself. But there's a model for acoustic reflectivity and there's a model for materials. Okay, so let's get those two and then join them three together. And so I end up with three pieces. That piece, this is how I'm going to formulate that solution into the, into the flavor I want. Let's say I'm going to build a knowledge graph. How am I going to take the that model into a, into a knowledge graph piece? So how am I going to take that piece into a knowledge graph piece? And then how am I going to make another piece which joins them up? Okay, so how am I going to test it? The implementation has to be done by the end user of the block like No, no, the, the person designing the, 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 I mean, you're analyzing the problem, you're designing it, and you're, and you would be testing it as you go. You say, here's an example of the problem I've got. Okay, let's actually, oh, let's actually have a look at that window. Let's, let's take this bits of data. Let's, let's make sure I understand how to put that into the acoustics model. And let's put it into the, whatever, you know, the, Reflectively model, whatever. Let's see how how those two pieces then combine. So, with I don't know if you've ever had any experience with software engineering um, principles in general, but it's building test cases. Take a test driven approach. Okay, test driven approach, modular driven approach. Look for the standards. You look for software libraries that solves the problem. Now you don't want to reinvent bubble sort or whatever. Yeah. You find the software library. We haven't really had the software libraries for data models. Now that's that's one of the challenges because we haven't used those disciplines. But I guess you know, the way I'm doing it is we're gradually building up you know, in my domain, which is a geospatial domain, and so APIs and software libraries, you know, the equivalents of data model libraries. And but the, the principles, you know, test driven approach, bind it off bit by bit, test it as you go, um, and try to work out what the gap is between. You know, um, you know what's already available and where you need it to be, and then yeah, and then it's these things. It's just interesting, and you get better with the experience. I mean, it's it's a it's 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 just a um, an art form, but it's also the um, it's also the mindset. I mean, I I a lot of my um, early work in industrial um, you know, being people Kimbler. You know, red hot metal moving around at three times the speed of sound. It's fun. You've got to be really make sure things work. And the only way you can do that is by breaking it down you know, to, um, to 
small piece of them, making sure those bits are really robust and then do the next bit. And too much we end up, I mean, the number of software projects have to rescue you every morning in where I've got 600,000 lines of code, what does it do? Well, nobody what pieces are there. You can't tell, it's a big one looking thing. And you throw it away and you start again. Uh, it's just, you've got to, got to have a systematic approach for complex problems. There's no one here is talking about trivial problems. Yeah? That's, that's not what you need PhD students to do for. You're talking about complex problems. So you, I think you have to just see if you can find the way you're going to simplify the problem into pieces. And how can you test it and make sure your pieces now are, are the right size? The more testing, the faster it'll be at the end. It slows you down to the beginning, but you, you're, 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 you speed up. Otherwise, you end up the opposite of the As it gets more complicated, it just becomes harder and harder to, 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 to deal with. So, and that's generic advice. It may not be terribly difficult. But I'm, I'm more than happy just to have a look at that particular project design to have a look at an area where you know, mm. potentially they will give them that. But, that these standards may apply, blah, blah, blah. So, so that's you know, one of the reasons I'm here is to say hello and to say, you know, and see if we can get some. Um, Give these up uh, um, or is this is planning to work with ADC and then my means there's some there's some resources available for me to sit down there and help you know, reviewing project designs and seeing where there are opportunities to you know, modularize, standardize, or just even connect you with this huge international network of people doing stuff. But, um, it's a lot of stuff I don't know, but I know people who know people who know. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, somebody else, you, you, um, yeah. you go. Um, yeah. Um, well, um, about my research, um, now I'm not sure whether my research content are too broad or too wide, <laughs> and it's too complicated to uh, finish the whole life cycle of that assessment. And the, also about the data collection, I think uh, it's hard to collect the whole life cycle. Uh, so one cases, I think, and uh, maybe we maybe can use uh, uh, different cases in different stages, and um, yeah, and I'm not sure whether it's too broad. <laughs> no, well, I think your very first thing you had ontology creation. I mean, that's what we're talking about. How do you go about making ontology? It's complicated to do this right. But the more you can leverage other people's work or, or proven bits, or test to see if they work, you know, the more you can, um, uh, you, know, you can get over that bit quickly. Find a nice small piece. And then move on to the uh, all the rest of it. Then testing how good your model is <laughs> in many ways. But, um, but I mean that's that's certainly an area where I think um, you know, it's not a trivial task to do ontology creation for a domain in general. But if you can find a way of fast tracking that, uh, then that, that might be a helpful place to start. And then and then you can test to see whether that information model actually supports the rest of the the complex chain, and maybe once you have something to work with, you can do it a test a little bit through that system, but then try to get the whole thing. Hey, what about you? Do you have a question? Yeah, I uh, really interesting about the uh, one topic mentioned about the digital game. Uh, from the industry side, how do you uh, inter interpret the approach uh, from the industrial side to uh, real time data gathering and digital twin construct, uh, constructing the digital twin and using in an industry part? It's really, I think, uh, interesting that. Yeah, um, we have a digital twins um, working group, and it's been various attempts uh, within the community. Uh, and one of the challenges now. With the definition for this, it's like endless debate. It's like it just going around and around and around and around. Because um, the answer is, it's whatever it needs to be. Everything we do is about modeling some real world thing to do some useful work. And whether it's a large language model or a ontology model or a finite element analysis model or any other, they're all models of something where we expect that model not to be perfect, but to do something useful. And I think from the perspective of digital twins, um, digital twins are, uh, there's an expectation that they allow us, 
know, if you take it from the sort of the um, uh, industrial heritage of digital twins, I mean, it's cheaper to build a digital twin and smash it into a wall than build a, uh, a Ferrari every time, <laughs> okay? Um, uh, and to a certain extent, it's, I guess it's that um, expectation that you can run more what-if scenarios, so forth. And we're, um, it's, it's a digital twin, even if it's something totally trivial, but we're talking about we need digital twins when we have complex multi-domain problems because then we don't actually have established models that we understand. And so I think the, the um, my general feel of digital twin is that ultimately it's a flexible platform that you can bring in whatever source of information you discover are necessary you know, to work with your problem. And really its ability to evolve would be the thing that if I was out there with, if I was spending my money on, on a digital twin solution, I would be looking at its ability to evolve and adapt, okay, as the primary thing. And I'll be, and interoperability and the ability to swap a piece of out, not being tied to any piece of technology. Now, I don't think you know, the digital twin of tomorrow is, you know, or 10 years time, is going to use any technology as a digital twin of today. I take that back. There'll be software libraries that do visualization. There'll be pieces of those puzzles or basic meta models that'll be reused but packaged in better ways. But um, but yeah, the actual the overall packaging of a digital twin for that little model anything like it does in ten years time. And that's fair enough. We're still learning what we're doing. Um, so uh, yeah, so systems that are good at handling real time data. Let's find those. Find the ones which match that criteria. They don't expect you to put all your data into that system before you can use it. Let's make sure it does its job well, and uh, and it will be replaced with a, another system that or you add another system which uh, pulls in lidar data and does feature extraction. I want to be able to plug that in. So it's the ability to the ability to um to you know, replace, improve, update each piece as you go will be the key and design criteria. I would have if I was if I was paying money to invest in a digital twin. Um, but then if I was a politician, you'd probably focus purely as I do on some flash 3D visualization that you can show off at some press conference. Doesn't do much useful work other than you know, hopefully make someone vote for you again. <laughs> but uh, yeah, what's the useful work you think you can do? And who cares enough about it? And that's a big problem that everybody's trying to solve. <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't claim to have all the answers on that. But I don't know that anybody else does either. But don't stress too much about it. Just find a problem that you think is uh, is useful, worth solving, and assume that it's part of a bigger system. Okay. We have a very nice question, I believe, and I believe we have to continue with this kind of meeting. So, and I think that we can. Get again together after several months and to begin. And we can go to another place, for example, to civil engineering. And sure. we can come again here when we we can gather some way in the training center. Yeah? yeah. Shall we shall we try to pick up the day for the next meeting? Then we'll have a few more students joining. And then some of you are going to be very much uh, a little bit forward <laughs> with a little bit more ideas, and we can discuss again. Probably that time we are going to get to the tools, and you can we can see some kind of solutions. These are the data. These are the models that we have used, and these are the results. Yeah. What do you think? Today now. Let's do it. And when, when does 10 treat So I told them when I ate the November. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, I think we have our PhD confirmation review, review week um, in end of November. So that's probably six, the, the week starting from 16th. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, the OBA conference the week after. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, week of 18 is our PhD review, PhD review meetings. Yeah. I mean, we can pick one, like half a day of, you know, one, one day of that week, that's still fine. Yeah, but we can't do it now because we don't know, we've got quite a number of students on the, at least two of the student people here. But we can pick week of 25th, you have conference on that week? Yeah. You're not around here. No, about the next week, 2nd of December. You're going to be around? No, she is. Yeah. I will not be around. Uh, yeah, I think on that week, let's put that week of 18 November. If, if that is a good week, we will find a half a day on that day. Yes, Johnson? Prefer to do it just still on Monday or Friday, if you have to pick the date. Uh, this week, nineteen. Uh, yeah, I think we might have. We that. have supervision. We have meeting with you, Marie, but we we can skip. <laughs> it's okay. The two days, Monday or Friday. Friday, we can have drinks after. <laughs> <laughs> Probably week 22nd. Yes, it sounds good. Yeah. Are you? Yeah. Is it okay? Yeah, for most, and I probably need to double check our time yeah, table in that week. We don't know. We don't know yet. We can tend to be your happy. Okay. Yeah. It's very effective. Yeah, I'm sure that you are you are going to do your confirmation review that week. If there will be confirmation review for say and genius. Okay. okay. Very much. Similar to SW. AI day. <laughs> so similar time, 10 to 2 p.m. What about you? Well, I'm not sure whether, you know, from the AI perspective at this stage, I need to be here ahead of a trial for. I'm very happy to um, be looking at ontology engineering at some stage. Yeah. Um, and maybe we set up some separate activity focused on ontology engineering um, and helping anybody who is just a Uh, but yeah, I'm not sure that. Uh, okay. Um, I mean, I'm interested, but. Uh, um, perhaps. We see. Oh. We, let, let's focus that meeting on ontology. Then. Yeah. Yeah. And vocabulary is ontology. Yeah, rather than, rather than necessarily, AI. Focus on tools that you have yeah. in OGC. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's build a semantic, yeah. build a semantic model to. Yeah. I think about everybody here. But yeah. Then I'm, I'm more than happy to, again, have, you know, even run more of a practical workshop or whatever. Yeah, something we, hands we, on, yeah. Yeah, we can, we can just see what conversations emerge yeah. and also see um, uh, what might happen in the aura space. Um, that's kind of the hibernation. Yeah. 22nd, I'm available, but I think I'm not, so. Are you? 22nd, I'm available, but okay. I think I'm not. Okay, so 22nd. Right. Yeah, I think most of the students around the table will benefit from something hands on. Yeah. Yeah. I, think yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. I was I was hoping that this is what we can do yeah. hands on, but yeah. <laughs> okay, but we didn't I mean, come to the end. Yeah, I mean there's a lot to cover. We weren't gonna get very deep in today. But um but now we have been I focused on I think I'm just walking through some of the 
existing libraries and the way the tools work and kind of run a use case of taking an example and build it from scratch. That's sort of stuff really more tutorial. Wow. Well, do that probably. And then and then um and then people can have a go at themselves with me here to, to mentor in the afternoon or whatever you like and then you can also so break three three pieces of, I can do a, a bit of a hands-on tutorial. Um we could do uh a, then then a, a um well, sort of me sort of a a sort of presentation of it and then to be a hands-on tutorial and then a uh sort of a doctor's surgery looking at your own particular problem, the use cases and brainstorming how you might engineer your own ontologies for your particular projects. So Three yeah. yeah. Even now, like an hour and a half break. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And in the meantime, I'll send you some links around and people can ask questions. I will, I will learn if you ask questions. That's my superpower, uh, being very lazy and learning by your questions.